Hello everyone, Jeffrey Gardner here and welcome to The Lost Bots. Today we've got cats and dogs living together in harmony, mass hysteria for all you Ghostbusters fans. Uh, as we're honored to have Mr. Devin Krugley, practice advisor for VRM on the show today. So, D, care to give our audience a glimpse into the illustrious world of practice advising and just what the heck that means? I certainly can. So uh, I came to Rapid7 by way of... Uh being a consultant for several years. Um, first half of my career, I, I spent in the commercial space. So I, I share a little bit of both the uh, consumer client perspective, right? In working with vendors, managing vendors, um, and then on the delivery side, whether it be services or technology, um, delivering that and uh, you know making good in our promises to clients. So I think that was a, a big reason why I was attracted to the role. And I think similarly, why Rapid7 was attracted to me uh, to come in and fill the role. But at the end of the day, um, Rapid7, as it started to expand its portfolio beyond just traditional VM and Metasploit, as many of you know who know the history of the company, um, it was necessary to create practice areas. And so the practice areas across DR and VM and Threat Intel and Security Operations, DNR, as you know, um, we wanted to continue to cultivate specialization and expertise in those areas. Um, but we also wanted to retain as much of kind of the original collaborative culture, right? The stuff that's part of the organization's DNA, which is really unique here, um, uh, you know, and comes from kind of our, our humble beginnings. So aside from VM thought leadership and helping to drive uh, improved outcomes for our clients, um, which is a large part of my role, um, is also to act as kind of this, you know, similar to your role, Jeff, is to kind of act as this connective tissue so that the practices continue to work together um, to drive, you know, outcomes across all the, um, you know, disciplines that we play in within the security space. I am so glad this is being recorded because that was a much better explanation of what a practice advisor does than I've ever given. So I'm going to take this and, and write that down for, uh, for any future conversations I need to have. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that one, man. You so bet. Detection response and vulnerability management, um, you know, often kind of regarded as two separate distinct programs um, where the twain shall never meet. Um, but a little bird told me that, you know, kind of like myself, you feel having, you know, a proper and high performing vulnerability management program can greatly assist with uh, proactive and reactive efforts um, within a DNR program. So um, would anyone care to explain? And that was my Mr. Zod voice from Fifth Element, and it was horrible. Um, but go for it, man. Yeah, yeah, I, I won't. Uh, I won't spring my Mr. Zod voice on anybody. I don't have a good Superman either. But um, so I think uh, you know, truth be told, I come with some bias. You know, my my personal belief. I don't know this this necessarily the belief of Rapid Seven, but my personal belief is vulnerability management as a discipline, as a practice, should not be too far from, from disaster, you know, uh, dis, uh, sorry, um, discover, uh, detection and response. <laughs> one more time, detection and response. Thank Here you very much. Um, and, and the reason for that, right, is that the dissemination of weaknesses, whether they be in operating systems or software or firmware, right, has long been kind of this spoken goal. And I do mean spoken, uh, goal for quasi mature, you know, vulnerability management program. So extending the program um, results and the program reporting, um, you know, really are uh, bear great consequence, right? Um, the opportunities to increase the context, which we talk about all the time in the DNR space, right? As well as the visibility of those assets for the alerts to which we're responding. So, uh, you know, it, it goes without saying, and everyone has experienced this before, or, or at least thought about it, right? That it spends time in security operations. Boy, it would really be nice to know if the system is vulnerable to CVE, you know, X, Y, blue. Yeah. Um, and I, I say spoken, going back to that word I mentioned, that um, it is a an exception today that, uh, security operation centers truly, truly make use of that information on a regular basis. Now, that's not to say that they don't have access to it and they can't look it up, um, but it actually making its way into a SIM for enrichment and for other purposes and having it, you know, fingertip ready for analysts to take a look at is, is still a work in progress. Um, I think that, you know, that as an operational outcome and, and an operational kind of value add around vulnerability management or the, the, the merger, if you will, the, of vulnerability management security operations is an easy one. 
um, more important, well, maybe not more importantly, but certainly equally as important at the macro level, right? Understanding the risk across network segments and applications um, and to create mitigating controls and vulnerable specific alerting for security operations um, it, it is also a net value, right? Um, at the most advanced level, this is a case where vulnerability data is being used to trigger or insert itself into the DNR lifecycle, helping to deliver risk reduction um, outside of normal patching cycles, right? So it's almost a, um, a rationale, if you will, for security operations teams to take action outside of an alert because we have a portion of the network or an application that's particularly susceptible, right? Given the volume of vulnerabilities or the misconfigurations, or maybe it's a particular department within the organization that requires additional monitoring or additional alerting or other mitigating controls, as I mentioned. So there's both, I think the operational kind of the tactical value, but then there's also, and I won't say the, the S word, the strategic word, um, <laughs> but there's value beyond that, right? to help drive risk reduction in the organization. And again, it's not, um, it's not unheard of, right? That organizations are, are using vulnerability data this way, but um, it, it's certainly the exception. It, would, uh, it is our goal as an organization, my goal as an organization, and I know you and I have talked about it many, many times, right? That uh, there is a, a deluge of information that comes in into uh, VRM, but uh, but it typically is used for you know the traditional uh, scanning and reporting purposes, and, and doesn't necessarily already make it always make it into security operations teams. It, in my experience, it, it rarely does, and I think the key word that you hit on there is is context. It helps inform DNR of those things where it's like there are a lot of systems that can't be patched. There's patching schedules. There's issues with harder software limitations. If that data is not being shared with the operational teams, they might not be aware that these are systems that may be watched more closely and then things start to fall apart during an actual incident and they're finger pointing and blaming and all of that stuff. And it's just, it's key to map these two together. So that perfectly ties into the next question, which is when, you know, creating or retooling an existing VM program, um, you know, where should somebody start? Like what's a, what's a good solid footing to set yourself off on? Yeah, I would say, you know, in every organization is a bright little shiny snowflake or large shiny snowflake for that matter. Um, but I, I, I believe and have, you know, experienced this on numerous occasions, whether it be, you know, uh, project work or whether it be the delivery of a managed service, um, both new and old programs can benefit from some good old fashioned education and awareness. Now, I'm not suggesting education and awareness in terms of email hygiene or URL interrogation techniques or the three R's uh, reading, reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's right. That. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It, it, a little, little more advanced, but, but I do um, certainly recommend that that education is a bit of a retrospective, right? Educating yourself and others in the bright, shiny security tower on how well the business understands and participates in, in the management of vulnerability risk, right? Do they have skin in the game? Does accountability, not responsibility, does accountability roll up to the appropriate business owners? And finally, if, if it's not in place, right, um, for the organization, the security organization, that is to be a catalyst to help steward or shepherd that cultural change. Because for organizations that don't already involve the business, right, that, that is sometimes a monumental effort in order to involve them and get them to a level of understanding where they're able to use that vulnerability information um, to, to drive some sort of decision. So let, let's take the classic example, right? Me as a business owner, I have two or three applications that roll up to me. It's what I use to do business, right? It's, it could be for client, it could be for internal consumption. And I'm on Java version 1.4.2. Now we know that's a vulnerable version of Java, but in order to refactor that application, right? It's gonna cost X number of dollars. Well, that application owner, right? That business owner, may never fully grasp the implications if we're not driving that visibility and driving that appreciation for risk to him so that he can use part of his budget or starts to think about using part of his budget and his resource allocation to address that problem. Risk for a single application is really risk across the business, right? As we all know, it's the weakest link. 
um, not necessarily uh, any one specific vulnerability or even group of vulnerabilities. Uh, so being able to drive that picture, that visibility into the business is, is definitely a place to start. Um, and, and gaining an understanding, right, Go, going back to your question, is, is step number one, right? You have to understand whether or not that, that's even part of the organizational mantra or culture to, to have that, uh, that available to you. Going, it's, it's a theme that's been present on multiple episodes of this show, and I think I've harped on it, you know, in our conversations, going back to the basics. Yeah. You can never underestimate. I mean, even black belts, they still practice punches and kicks. They never stop doing it. You know, no matter how many katas you learn, you always go back to the basics. And I think that communication and the accountability piece are really key. I mean, especially like the accountability piece. I mean, there's been so many meetings where it's like, no, I'm not responsible for this. This is the networking team's job to pat, you know, do this. Or it's the application owner's job to like having a clear delineation of at the end of the day, like, no you're the application owner. This is, this is you, or if it is split, like who's responsible for what, just so you can cut through that, that line of communication. Um, but you're just setting me up for, for questions left and right, man. I appreciate this. So yeah, yeah, we've, got the, we've got the foundation. So I always kind of like to do like the top, top three, top two. I think we'll stay with the top two today because we can talk for the next two hours about, um, you know, top 500 things you should probably do. Um, but what are the top two, in your opinion, just, you know, rapid seven head off, just practitioner, practitioner, what are your two most important keys to success for a VM program? Um, you know, again, it can be a little unique depending on the organization and kind of where they are on their journey, but, uh, but certainly, you know, consistent vis- visibility, meaning that the reports and the, and the tooling and the process um, that is used for vulnerability management is consistent. Therefore, you're pr- providing consistent results but that that view of risk is consistent across the entire organization, right? And it's presented in such a way that it can be used as decision input going back to some of the other soapbox uh, notes I made around, you know, driving change. And in order to do that, having the decision criteria uh, to to be informed. For example, right, do we we need to increase our patching throughput to keep pace with the backlog? Um, Is it time to upgrade our browser versions? Another one is, is, does the security operations team need investments, you know, in resources or, or tooling to adequately manage, uh, you know, the, our mitigated control needs when we can't patch? So being able to provide that visibility in order to drive those fundamental decisions, not whether or not, uh, you know, the, the more tactical decision about when we patch or how often we patch or if we patch, um, but the broader decisions, right, to truly manage risk. Not, not the day-to-day operations, I think, is key. Having that visibility and, again, being able to communicate that in, in business terms. The second, I think, is, is the effectiveness and efficiency in detecting and addressing vulnerability blind spots, right? So, again, weakest, weakest link, right, or, or you know, uh, uh, security in depth, right, uh, is, is, is a key element. Um, and, and the question is, right, does our vulnerability management lifecycle allow us to one detect and then do something about areas within our network, within our environment that we may not be scanning and assessing on a regular basis? Um, I think uh, it is especially poignant right now, given the distribution of our workforce um, post COVID, as well as right this uh, continued proliferation into the cloud, right? Asking questions like, does our VM team ac- have access to our IP space management tool? Or are they getting a feed? What about all of the new subnets and uh, addresses that continue to come online and, and are uh, deprecated within our cloud environments? So providing that team that type of feed, do they, one, ask, do they even have a feed, right? Where are they getting that information from? Are they you know, that they have static cider blocks from six months ago and are just expected to kind of stumble on this, uh, which is sadly more often than not the situation I run into uh, when we're going in to help clients. So, um, you know, having that effective measure or detection capability to understand if you have complete coverage and then being able to do about it, maybe that's three, not really two, Jeff, I'll squeak in there. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, you, you can't, um, you can't manage, uh, you know, what you don't see and uh, being able to do that in, in VM is especially critical. And I, I, I will echo your point um, 
as we head into the end point, which is where we wrap up our segment. I um, mean, you know, I think we keep going back to back to basics and, you know, having that accurate, you know, hardware inventory or just asset inventory and that feed, as you like to call it, you know, with the business units, with IT, with the networking team, that goes back to the point you made earlier, which was communication and building those relationships. All of this kind of ties together. And a lot of it isn't necessarily the technical hard skills that you would expect. It rarely is. And, and it's, it is. We've been detecting and analyzing vulnerabilities for a long time. We're pretty good at that. Doing something about them is an entirely different story. And then you extend that into the application space, right? Above the infrastructure tier. And that, that's where things get really interesting. But that's uh, that's fodder for another talk, I think. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's being able to tell that story. I mean, I think it comes down to storytelling and relationship building. If I can summarize a lot of it up, um, you know, which leads into the communication, which will help you build that feed. Which you know, the technical stuff I think is one of the easier aspects to get a hold of. It's really you know scanning and you know the vulnerabilities and whatnot. But getting people to do something about it mm-hmm. that takes relationships, that takes time. That's not something that you're going to be able to do day one right off the bat unless you have those relationships already built so it's you know necessarily take a step back from you know our heads and cves and whatnot and maybe spend you know bifurcate our time and start building those relationships up front because that way it'll make our remediation and you know mitigation that much easier at the end of the day and we'll feed into that loop of you know getting the security team involved getting that into the sim like all that takes that relationship building at the very beginning, unless you have a product which, you know, takes that vulnerability data and sticks it right into the sim automatically. You're welcome, marketing folks. Um, <laughs> so that'll wrap up this episode. Um, thanks for all of your time today, Devin. I really appreciate it. And a special thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. Do a little sing- shameless self-promotion. If you like this series and want to see it grow, uh, remember to share this out to all your networks, tweet, gram, TikTok, Vine. And if you're watching this on YouTube and ideas for topics for future episodes, um, you know, please let us know in the comment section below. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Jeff.